Welcome to the second part of lecture 6 of experimental vibration analysis. In this video we discuss the most common estimator for power spectral density functions, the Welsh method. The content of this lecture is found in chapter 10 of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. We remember from lecture 5 that the power spectral density of a random signal is the spectrum or Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. The PSD is interpreted such that the area under it in a certain frequency range equals the mean square of the signal in that same range. And the PSD has the units of EU squared per hertz. So if we measure the units EU, standing for engineering units, then the PSD has the engineering units squared per hertz. For example, an acceleration measured in meters per square second thus results in a PSD with units of meters per square second squared per hertz. We now start with a periodogram. This was the uh, first historical attempt to find an estimate of the PSD, and we will see that it's the basis of the Welsh estimator. The periodogram is the magnitude squared of the DFT of the signal x of n divided by the length of the entire signal. This means it is computed by taking one long FFT of the whole signal. Similarly, with two different signals x and y, we can compute the cross periodogram by multiplying the DFT of signal y by the complex conjugate of the DFT of signal x and again divide by the length of the signal. The periodogram is an estimate of the PSD. It was discovered early, however, in the development of the periodogram that it has some bad characteristics. The problem with the periodogram is that its normalized random error equals unity. This means that the error is 100%, so to speak, and this is independent on the amount of data you have. So it does not help to measure more data. It does not improve the periodogram estimate. For periodic signals, however, uh, the periodogram is a good estimate, provided there is no or little noise. Here are some examples of periodograms. On the left-hand side, you see the periodogram of a random signal with 512 samples in the upper plot and four 1096 samples in the lower plot. Clearly, the lower periodogram, based on eight times more data than the top plot, is certainly not better. Actually, it's worse. And it's typical that the periodogram of a random signal behaves more and more wildly the more samples you have. On the right-hand side, however, we see that the periodograms of a signal consisting of a random part plus harmonic components is quite different. As you can see from this plot, the periodogram has the property that the periodic components stand out better in the periodogram with more samples. Thus, the periodogram is a good idea for periodic signals mixed with random signals. The Welsh method for computing PSDs is the method most commonly used today. It is based on short windowed periodograms which are averaged in the frequency domain. This procedure is equivalent to the one we used for the order power spectrum estimation in the previous video. So as indicated here, you divide your data into blocks which cover two lines here. So each of two segments here forms one FFT block. Then we have overlapping, so the second block starts here uh, away into the first block, but not waiting until the entire block is finished. Now the formula for the Welsh estimate is that the single-sided Welsh PSD estimate of the signal X of M that we denote g hat sub xx is a scaling factor uppercase sub s sub p times the average of the magnitude squared 
of the window d of t of x, which we denote x sub x and m. Similarly, for two signals, x and y, the cross spectral density is produced by averaging the d of t of y of n of the, the output signal times the complex conjugate of the d of t of x, the input or reference signal. In section 939 in the book, a scaling factor is deduced which produces a scaling of the DFT so that summations of the square of the frequency bins produce a correct mean square value of the signal. This is related to the equivalent bandwidth of the time window used, that is, the bandwidth BE in Hertz is the width of a filter which lets the same amount of power pass as the bandpass filter of the parallel filter bank determined by the time window. This factor can be shown to be the block size n times the ratio of the window values squared divided by the sum of the window values squared. This ratio is finally multiplied by the frequency increment of, of the DFT, delta f. Here we see the picket fence effect uh, or illustration of the DFT. It illustrates that the estimate of the DFT at each frequency bin is a result of the signal passing a bandpass filter with a certain shape depending on the time window. You re should remember this from lecture 5. Now the equivalent bandwidth is the width of a rectangular filter with the same surface squared as the bandpass filter. For the Henning window, this factor, the equivalent noise bandwidth, is exactly 1.5 times delta f. Sometimes we use the normalized equivalent bandwidth b sub e n, which is a dimensional, di dimensionless variable equal to b sub e divided by delta f. So for a handing window, b sub e n is exactly 1.5. We now go back to the scaling factor, S sub P for the PSD estimate. We want the PSD to be such that the area under the PSD equals the mean square level of the signal. Using the equivalent noise bandwidth, we find that the scaling factor S sub P used for the PSD estimator is 2 times A sub W squared divided by N squared and divided by the equivalent noise bandwidth B sub E. And this is a, uh, valid for all k's except the DC bin, for which we do not have a factor 2. You should note that this scaling factor S sub P equals the S sub A scaling factor we used for the auto power spectrum divided by the equivalent noise bandwidth B sub E. Now that we have established the Welsh estimator, we will look at its errors. As we have discussed previously in the course, there are two errors for random variables, bias and random errors. We start by investigating the bias error of the Welsh estimator. As we discussed in the lecture about the DFT, the truncation of the time signal leads to leakage. This can be interpreted also as a bias error in the PSD estimate. The bias error can also be illustrated as an effect of the fact that we approximate a continuous function, the true PSD, with, so to speak, bars of width delta f, having the same power within the frequency width delta f. Naturally, as indicated in the picture here, this will produce a negative bias error at peaks as long as the width delta f is significant compared to the width of the peak. We can also describe the bias error as the result of the convolution of the true PSD of the signal with the Fourier transform squared of the window function. The window function is squared because the PSD estimate is formed by taking the magnitude squared of the DFT. This figure shows the true PSD 
uh, of a vibration signal on a resonant structure with a peak uh, and the result of the truncation which is slightly lower peak value and a rounder peak. We always use the Hanning window for estimating PSDs with the Welsh window. A good approximation for the bias error in the Welsh PSD estimate when using Hanning window is shown here. The main thing here is that it's proportional to the square of the frequency increment delta f and the ratio of the second derivative of the PSD divided by the PSD. This means that, first of all, the bias error goes towards zero when delta f goes towards zero. And this is natural since the bars fit inside the continuous function when they become narrow enough. Second, we see that the bias error is largest when the second derivative of the PSD is large, that is around peaks. Now for vibration analysis, we are particularly interested in PSDs from second order systems, that is around peaks at resonances of structures. For such, for such signals, it turns out that the bias error is approximately proportional against delta F over BR. Here we see a plot of the normalized bias error of a PSD estimate around a resonance of a structure. The resonance is located at 10 Hz, and the plot shows a simulation result in green and the error according to the equation in the previous slide in blue. As you can see, the formula is a good description of the true but simulated bias error. You also see that exactly at the resonance, the bias error is negative whereas on both sides of the resonance, the error is positive. Here on the right-hand side is a plot of the maximum bias error without sign. So it's the absolute value of the negative bias error right at the resonance frequency in the left plot. So here we see the maximum bias error for a PSD measured at a resonance as a function of the ratio of the resonance bandwidth B sub R and delta F. And you may remember that B sub R is related to the damping and the undamped natural frequency of the system as shown here. And you should note that in log-log scale there is an approximately linear relationship and you find this same plot in the book. Next we will talk about the random error in Welsh PSD estimates. This is a commonly misunderstood subject, so we'll, we will treat it in some detail. It's erroneously explained in many textbooks on random data analysis. Now, the random error in a PSD estimate is a result of averaging the independent random PSD values at frequency bin k. Roughly speaking, we know that the normalized random error or standard deviation of based on m averages should be 1 over square root of m, the number of averages. And this is exactly true as long as we do not use overlapping segments. For PSD estimates, we can improve the error, however, by using overlap processing. The error then is complicated to calculate as there is correlation between the averages. And this effect is further influenced by the time window that we use. The random error based on an overlap of n minus d as indicated here uh, can be calculated as shown here. Note that it's the square of the error which is given here. We first assume that we have a block size n and that the blocks are starting with a distance d so that the overlap is n minus d as indicated in the figure here. Without overlapping, the term on the right inside the parenthesis here is zero. For overlapping, the function rho, however, uh, becomes non-zero and produces a larger random error because the averages are dependent and thus each average does not help to reduce the random error as much as an independent average would do. 
For overlap factors up to 50%, only the value rho of 1 is non-zero. But for increasing overlap percentages, more and more values of rho are then non-zero. And the function rho of q is simply a function of the window values, or the window function, as you see here. We start by assuming no overlap. If we have m averages, we then obtain a normalized random error, epsilon sub r, equal to 1 over the square root of m. When we apply overlap, we now define the equivalent number of averages, m sub e, so that the actual random error we have is equal to 1 over square root of m sub e. Of course, m sub e is, will always be smaller than m if we use overlapping. Here is a plot showing the relative increase in the random error as a function of overlap percentage. This is a little complicated, so we will illustrate it with an example. Assume that we have data with 100 non-overlapping blocks. This gives an equivalent number of averages, m sub e, equal to the actual number, that is 100, as long as we do not use overlapping. Now assume that we process the same data again using a handing window and, for example, 50% overlap. We then go into the graph here, go to 50% overlap and up to the handing window in blue, and out on the y scale we can read a value of 1.89. Now, 50% overlapping means that we have made 199 FFTs, not 200 because the last block will have half of its part outside the data. Now, the relative increase according to the plot is 1.89, meaning that the, the efficient number of averages is now 189, 1.89 times 100. And thus the random error we get, epsilon sub r, equals 1 over square root of 189. And this is slightly larger than the square root, the 1 over square root of 199 that we would have obtained had we used independent averages. This shows how you can use this graph to calculate the effect of overlapping. Now looking at the same plot in more detail, we can also see that the blue line for a handing window does not stop growing at 50%. It actually continues growing up to 62.5%. This is a little hard to see in this graph because it's computed with a resolution only of 10% uh, overlap. But the optimum of this function is 62.5% for a handing window, above which no improvement in random error is achieved. Now, it's not uncommon to see people using 75% overlap or even more uh, for estimating PSDs. This is obviously a waste of computational time. Uh, another observation is that you gain very little moving from 50% overlapping to 62.5% actually only gain 4% in the relative error. This results in the fact that the normal recommendation is to use Hanning window with 50% overlap for PSD estimation. Another observation in the figure is that even for the rectangular window, the red dotted line, even for this uh, window, there is some gain of using overlap processing. This is a little surprising, and it's not trivial to explain, so we will leave it at that here. Finally, we will present a plot from the book. Since the recommendation for PSD estimation with Welsh method is to use a handing window with 50% overlap processing, here is a plot which directly gives the relation between the normalized random error on the y-axis and the number of FFTs used in the averaging. 
This is usually what you enter into your FFT anal analysis system. In the plot, you can see that to get a random error of 10%, you should use approximately 100 averages. For 1% error, you would need more than 10,000 averages. So you realize that in practice, you, we will have to do with random errors in the range of a few percent. This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravibe.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.